I'm going to start by sharing my screen and the One People's Project. Right. Um, hi, Daryl. My name is Megan O'Rourke, and I'm here in CCTV uh, Center for Media and Democracy up in Burlington, Vermont. And we've been having conversations. Uh, one of our tenants, one of our mission-driven tenants is to uh, protect free speech. Um, you know, our organization's been around for, we're in our 40th year, and it's one of our founding tenants in community media is providing a space Um you know, originally it's around providing a space for marginalized voices. It's about providing a space for voices that may not have um, another venue. It's providing a space for voices that are um, outside the norm. Um, and um, recently we've been struggling with or grappling with or having conversations around what happens when free speech, and I wouldn't say these are new conversations, but they are they have um, new implications and they have, you know, there are people that are new to them that have new information. So tell us a little bit about you. You came um, to us through a relationship with Marina Brown. And um, who are you and what's the project that you're working on, the One People's Project? Well, One People's Project has been around for a little over 20 years. And um, we're basically an anti-fascist organization. We uh, we have uh, we responded to it. Our, our organization was uh, created in response to a white supremacist rally in Morristown, New Jersey. And what we basically are reporters, journalists. Um, the right likes to call them likes to call their lot citizen journalists, and that's pretty much what we have been. Um, but we have a little caveat. We also have been um, in the forefront of just putting anything and everything out there about the various individuals on the right, particularly the racist right, to um, out there so that people can get a complete picture as to what it is and who it is um, what we are dealing with. And we, use, we encourage people to do positive things to keep them from, uh, you know, being able to function that will include um putting out home addresses and such um that's what we had started out doing um and employments um whatever um, because when you're talking about employers we definitely want to know who is teaching our kids who is patrolling our streets who are our politicians and things like that we want to know who was involved in say um neo-nazi activity for example um, but this is what, and this, um, everybody calls it doxing now, and we just, we have always just called it reporting. Yeah, so that's how that's how people know us, and we've been pretty effective in that regard. So, tell me a little bit more about that. When you say, um, you know, how long has this kind of reporting been going on, and why do you feel like it's necessary? Well, it came about because in um, in the late in the early aughts. We were um we noticed that there was a website called the Nuremberg Files. It was a group of anti-abortion activists that, or at least one, a, a gentleman by the name of Neil Horsley, who's no longer with us. They had um they were publishing ab the names of abortion providers, and whenever one of them was murdered by someone from that circle, they would cross their names out as if eh, we we did a good thing today. You know, you had a number of abortion providers that um, would see this website or would see um, activists walking outside, um, protesting outside their clinics with their names and address and pictures on their placards. They took it to the Supreme, not Supreme Court, but they took it to court. The court defended their free, um, the freedom of speech of the um, anti-abortion activists. And our attitude immediately became well, we're doing this with one hand tied behind our back. If they're allowed to do um, th this kind of activity, then we should. But we wasn't looking to do it in a malicious way. We simply really did want to know, want people to know who was in their neighborhood. Yeah. And, and that was, and that was pretty much the gist and it's always has been. So that's where we're coming from. I know a lot of people are concerned about it, but they should be more concerned about the people that we are talking about. It's not a matter of opinion that some folks out there are causing harm. 
We got to know how to stop them from causing them. And that's why we are as aggressive as we are. Yeah. Um, which gets a little bit to the point of like, a citizen group is doing this. So let's talk about the example. If you have a police officer who is posting racist comments, either blatant racist comments or subtly racist comments, whatever, you know, however you want to put those two terms, Mm -hmm. um, we can recognize that it it may show an inability to uh, do your job effectively and protect everybody equally under the law, right? And it's important maybe to show that that person is engaging in those activities. But why is it coming? Why is it being left to citizens to do this in your mind? Why why do you think citizens are left to be the ones to do this work? And what's important about that? Either a citizens is the, and you, you call yourself a journalist. Are other journalists, are other media outlets doing this work or not? Well, I'll tell you like this. I mean, I, I, my vocation is journalism. I am actually a published journalist. Yeah. Um, but I would say when you talk about other media outlets, I think it's because other media outlets don't do it as aggressively, don't focus on these particular issues as um, as aggressively, I should say, as we are. Um, we, we felt that there was a void. So we definitely decided that we needed to fill that void. That's not to say that you don't have um media outlets that pursue um that pursue issues of um you know for lack of a better term domestic terrorism you know but there has been often times and i've had discussions with reporters in the past where they will have a story that is about somebody out there that is from the neo-fascist right or what have you that has some sort of influence and the story will get killed because their editor feels that it's um, not what they're looking for in um, via their outlet or what have you. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's basically giving somebody attention that they don't think deserve it or what have you, whatever reason. Yeah. Um, and that just tends to be frustrating to, um, to reporters. So if we have that situation going on and people need to know who these people are and what they are doing, then that's the void that we're for. Yeah. Um, I do not want to discount the fact that you do have um, outlets that will write about these things, especially now. Really, over the past, I will, ever since the ascension of Donald Trump, there has been a lot more of an effort. As, since the ascension of Donald Trump, and especially after Charlottesville, there has been a lot more attention paid um, to these elements. And you do see a lot more um, journalists, a lot more um, media outlets um, calling it out and um, and pointing everybody in the direction of some of these characters. But, um, but beforehand, like in the 90s or in the early aughts or what have you, um, they were few and far in between. And a lot of this stuff that you will find will probably be from um, you know, leftist websites, for example, you know, we would be the ones out there basically sounding the alarm. So um, how, what's been the impact of some of this work? Do you, can you talk about that at all? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, you know, whenever you put information out there like this and people realize that um, you have these folks working in this kind of capacity, that are their neighbors or that um or community workers or whatever you they tend to take action i mean we've had people fired from their jobs um we had somebody that was fired from halberton because they was involved with some of this we've had um somebody who was running um to be a judge in connecticut and their um and their husband was someone who had um who had been involved for years and we knew him before all of this um, so we was basically um, sounding the alarm, and we caused somebody to um, basically lose their um, lose their race, uh-huh. um, especially considering she was running as a Democrat. Yeah. Um, we've had um, we've had some. Unfortunately, there were some folks that, even though we would expose them as being um, involved in this activity, no action was taken. Case in point, and I'm not going to mention any names, but there was someone who. Um, who was a contractor, civilian contractor, 
for the military that was based down in Maryland. And he was associated with some nefarious hate groups out there. His role, his role in um, as a military contractor was making explosives. Uh-huh. So that was definitely a concern for us. And we definitely let him let his um superiors know um that we was doing this story on this particular person. And even though he was suspended for a couple of months, as far as I can near tell, he still has his job. Um, but these are the kinds of reasons, these are the reasons why we um why we do what we do. We need to let people know where these folks are. So and we're and, we just- an, and we had an impact. Yeah. So where does this for you um, intersect with the conversations around free speech? Well, free speech is never a problem. If you guys want to say, if somebody wants to say whatever it is they um, want to say, uh, when it comes to this element, it's pretty useful for us. I do not like, however, when free speech is used as a cop out. If I am going to criticize somebody who is... um, about these kinds of activities or who was about this kind of um, belief system, fascism in this case, I don't want the response to be that, well, he he or she has their freedom of speech. The response should be, well, why am I wrong for criticizing? It's not going to be because he he or she has their freedom of speech. It's It's because that person's position is okay for whatever reason. You know, Uh if I hear the first thing that comes out of somebody's uh, mouth that um, I should not um, go after them because they have their right to speak. I take that as an attempt to ironically shut me up. Yeah. Yeah. And then I get very angry (laughs) because now, now I just see you as a phony when it comes to, championing free speech or whatever this is not the issue is not about free speech it really is about what's being said we already know how to deal with somebody who makes it clear that they are really not about ironically enough the rights and freedoms that we all enjoy once we start um once we identify somebody as being like that we're going to respond we do have that right to respond so it's that's I mean, one of the things that people say is the way you counter bad speech or the way you counter maybe even hate speech, although hate speech, bad speech, kind of, I don't know if those are synonymous terms, is with more speech. And so it yeah. sounds like it's a little bit of what you're doing. I'm wondering if there's other ways that you see engaging in community to counteract hate speech. Well, see, here's the thing about that. And I should say often one of the... um one of the things that I have been making the point about is that, yes, the best way to fight hate speech is with more speech. But when we use that more speech, the response should not be another another caveat, another way to try to discourage us from engaging. Case in point, best way to fight hate speech is with more speech. We use more speech. And then someone immediately responds with, maybe you should just ignore them. Or maybe both sides should just calm down. It, it's it's an attempt to quell the conversation. I've I've had that a number of times, but I will also say, and this is where things get dicey. It shouldn't, but it get di- it gets dicey here. When you start talking about um, what to do once that once we go um, past the threshold of free speech, then there comes freedom of association. If I don't like what you're about, I don't want to have anything to do with you, and I won't. If I want to tell everybody why I'm not going to have anything to do with you, I will. And if they agree with me and similarly want to um, avoid such and such a person because of his or her political beliefs, they can do that. That is well within our rights as well. Um, And I say this because I am going to use the example of um, those who will tell you, for example, if you don't like such and such. If you don't like what you're hearing, if you don't like a certain joke, if you don't like um, what basically what is being said, just change the channel. Just walk away. I mean, like I said before, ignore them. When we do that, and, and it, it, when we do that, all of a sudden complaints about cancel culture come up. Mm. 
Now that's disgusting because I said I was going to mention the name. I said I was going to mention somebody like Bill Maher because Bill Maher does this all the time. He, as far as um, as far, in in my opinion, is a rabid Islamophobe. Um, and he he would always tell you he would always told you in the in the name of being a free speech champion, um, that if you do not like what what we have on the show, just change the channel. People have changed the channel. And that's when he started complaining about cancel culture. Uh-huh. No, you cannot have it both ways. Uh-huh. I, I once said on the, um, on the Dr. Phil episode that I thought the cancel culture was course correction. I'm not wavering from that. It's like you have you have um you have made your dis- choices. You have made your choices. We are making ours. We are basically obliging you. So how do we end up, um, Daryl? Maybe there's some examples of this because it's it, as an as you're doing this out of a deep care for your community, but also I imagine some level of self-preservation and safety. There is. Yeah. There is. So, well, I guess maybe rather than me assuming, why, what draws you to this work and why are you doing this work? You know, I, I think, I mean, of course, I'm a Black man. I'm going to be concerned about the things that hurt my community, of course. Um, but it goes beyond that. It really is for myself um, a desire to make things right. I do not like seeing people getting harmed. I really don't. And my approach has always been, even when I was a kid, that if you are seeing somebody get hurt, the person doing the hurting has to have some sort of comeuppance or at the very least has to be prevented from causing that harm. So there are times when I just feel that there is something that I can do. Like I said, I'm a journalist. They always say the pen is mightier than the sword. My pen is a hell of a sword. (laughs) Are there things that you see that people are doing out there in the realm of speech, in the realm of community building that are um, that are working to help move conversations forward? And along that same line, are there conversations that are just off the table that just like it is 2022? What is it? 2023. It's 2023. (laughs) 2023. And we just like. We feel like we're going backwards, but. (laughs) Yeah. We just don't need to be having that conversation. I think the only reason why I would say that there are some that um, we don't even, uh, we don't need to have the conversation is because we've had it already. That that would be the only argument I would have in that regard. Um, There are some things that we really don't have to discuss unless you got something new to bring to the table. Uh Uh-huh. Now, that gets dicey. It does not mean that we can't have the conversation. It just means that, what's the point to it? We already know this is bad. We don't have to tell people that murder is wrong, for example. But if you want to have the discussion about why we can't have murder, <laughs> then I'm I'm open to it, but I'm going to look at you with side eye. <laughs> yeah. Well, except that we do have to i mean if if you're a pacifist right and certainly we had that kind of situation where folks for example who were pacifists and uh fought sort of you know argued against involvement in world war ii right well i said well well let's be fair i did say murder which means i'm using which technically i'm using a legal term which means i am talking about an actual crime not a not a word i'm not against i'm yeah I don't want to say I'm not against killing, but 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 to your point, yeah, it should not be the mission in life to kill. That's my opinion. Yeah. Having said that, I am also someone who is prepared to defend myself however I need to defend myself, which may include deadly force. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we can have, like I said, that's a conversation that we can have. Yeah. What I, when I was using that as an example, I, I was basically trying to say that there are certain things that in this society and within our communities, we have accepted and we have said, saying, establishing this yep. is how our society goes forward, bar none. I mean, there is no argument against that. We pretty much have a consensus in that. That I mean, maybe maybe murder might have been a little bit off the chart, <laughs> but that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Um, 
what are other? That, yeah, um, good. So, sorry. Yeah, there yeah. are times when we can have um, we can have a conversation about anything. Let's just be real. We can have a conversation about anything. Nothing is off the table. But there are some things that when you when you address it, people are going to feel away. People are going to be like, okay, why is this coming up? Yep. I guess that's the part where I think, you know, we just had this conversation uh, again with a couple of participants in the studio around free speech, but it felt like the underlying issue was really around transgender rights, transgender visibility, the ability for trans people to feel safe in the community. And I, I, I guess this comes to the point of when people say, well, you're taking away my free speech and, you know, what do we need to do to engage in the speech that needs to happen. Sometimes, I, I, will, I will tell you, I saw that. I, I, I saw that particular conversation. Yeah. Um, and without getting into it too much, um, I would just simply say that it speaks to, that conversation spoke to um, a larger issue that I that I have when it comes to people who say that they are championing free speech. A lot of these um, so-called free speech absolutists or free speech warriors or whatever are really trying to defend the indefensible. Uh -huh. Or as I had tried to allude to earlier, trying to get out of an argument that they really don't want to be in. And I don't, and that's when it gets, that's when I get upset. That goes back to when I was saying, all right, I'm going to explain to you why I don't like what you just said. And the retort should not be, well, they have their freedom of speech. No, um, there is a reason why we believe the way we do. And it's going to come out regardless of whether or not, um, whether or not you like it. And if you are about something that harms my community, your free speech isn't going to prevent me from being proactive. And no, you do not have to wait until it's a crime committed behind that speech to do something. There are other ways. I was talking earlier about cancel culture, for example. Uh -huh. um, the other reason why I thought it was disingenuous is because there are times when we have seen the argument of free speech come up. And like I said, it's usually used to defend the indefensible. If you're talking about someone um, who you don't, who some of these so-called free speech um, absolutists disagree with, all of a sudden there's not a discussion about free speech. And if there's a discussion about the particular issue. And if you do bring up the free speech issue, many a times I have had something about yelling fire in a crowded theater come up. Uh -huh. So I think when we talk about free speech, we have to be honest and we have to be fair. If we find those two things missing, if we find those two things missing, you're not dealing with somebody who's um, a true player in this regard. I mean, one of the things I'm, one of the things that I noticed is that those who champion free speech um, never talk about. Colin Kaepernick in, the, in that language. Never talk about Jamel Hill in that language. Jamel Hill called Donald Trump a white supremacist. Per, um, press, then Press Secretary um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders said that that was a fireable offense. Uh -huh. He eventually lost the job. Yeah. We're talking about the Tennessee Three who got expelled for participating in a protest um, on, the, um, on behalf of their constituents. Um, at the uh, Tennessee State House, they were expelled. They eventually um, were voted back in, but they're still being harassed. And that was a free speech issue. But some of these free speech absolutists said, well, they didn't follow the rules. Yeah. I mean, I think in this case, I mean, I think in this particular instance, I'm guessing that in that program, um, everybody there would agree that Colin Kaepernick's act is an act of free speech. It's and, one thing to and agree I, that yeah. it was an act of free speech. It's another thing to actually say it. Very seldom yeah. is he defended on those grounds. Yeah. In fact, he still it, it, he still doesn't have a job. Yeah. He still is not, he's still blacklisted from the NFL. 
Yeah. I which mean, comes to the which mm-hmm. which for me, and this is the part that I really struggle with, is that I feel like that's where we need to not allow the concept of free speech to be stolen by the right in a way that says, I'm going to say whatever I want to say, whenever I want to say it. And I think there's also something in there about power and free speech that's important to recognize. I mean, we just had a program here on um, the situation in Palestine. There are many people that would say, oh, you, you shouldn't be having that program on your channel. You know, you shouldn't have that program on your channel because Hamas is a bunch of terrorists and they shouldn't be given a voice, right? Mm-hmm. When we take away the rights of some, do we not take away the rights of of everyone? How do how do we get past this absolutist and and on a community like on a really community not on a in, not on a theoretical level like on a community basis? What do we do? Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, the reason why um, the various people ha- are defended on the grounds of free speech is because defending their speech protects ours that is the whole concept to all of it yeah and when it is repeatedly being used to undermine our protections then it's defeating the purpose you know i mean you cannot you cannot tell me to defend that neo-nazi over there you tell me to defend that neo-Nazi's free speech while you're telling a Palestinian student that they can't have their protest on campus. Yeah. You can't do that. You yeah. simply cannot do that. And I don't, you can sit there and talk about who killed how many people, yada, 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 whatever. I know a lot of neo-Nazis that's killed a lot of people. Uh-huh. <laughs> and yet those same neo-Nazis are able to come up on college campuses and speak or far right wingers even. And or or those who champion those um neo Nazis. So, so what do we, we do? Cannot we, sit here yeah. and play both can't yeah. play um double standards like that. So is there a, something that the One People's Project is advocating for on a community basis? You know, here we are, we sit just as a you know, in a very simple way, a community media center with um a strong heart, you know, deep values and we care about the people in our community. What does a community, what does a community media center do? What does the One People's Project offer as concrete things we can do? To We've been doing it for over, for over 20 years, as I said. And I think the most important thing is that information is key. Free speech <laughs> really does allow us to hear who the problem people are. And it also allows you to let your community and your neighbors know who are the proper people. We, you know, I'm going I'm to use, um, no, I'm not going to use them yet. I, I, there's something that I was going to say, but I think that it's really important to understand that free speech is not meant to be used as a weapon against you. <laughs> it's supposed to be used as a protection for you. And to that end, as I had said earlier, whenever you hear something that is objectionable, whenever you hear something that doesn't sit well with you, that you are not um, a party to, that you don't want to be a party to, you don't have to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, they said it themselves. If you don't like it, you can walk away from it. You can speak out against what you had just heard. You know, you don't have to, you don't even have to give that person a platform. You know, this is where I was going to bring up Rush Limbaugh. Because well, Rush Limbaugh where, I mean, as a community media center, we do, mm-hmm. quote unquote, have to. Our policies. Yes, but here's something that, yeah. here's a line. Here's something that, I mean, you have to, we all have to, not just because you're a community based outlet, but I mean, to quote Rush Limbaugh, he was going after feminists at the time and he was trying to correct himself when he says you should be silenced. Um, He, he said, Freedom of speech, your right to speak does not mean does not mean your right to be heard. He said that a couple of times on his radio show. Yeah. And yeah. really? He's right. 
Yeah. We don't have to be a party to your nonsense. And we won't be. Just like you don't have to be a party to anything that I'm about. That's fine. But you can't get angry when a huge swath of people say later for you. Uh-huh. <laughs> when a huge swath of people just show you the door, that is what it is. If you cannot, I mean, you use your freedom of speech to make your argument if you don't want that to happen. If you cannot make a compelling argument, we're moving on. Yeah. That's what a community does. You can decide for yourself whether or not you want to have something to do with somebody. You can make um, you can also tell your community, your neighbors, why you don't want to have something to do with somebody. Um, they can either agree or disagree. And everybody can stay away from said problem person uh -huh. or rally around them. However, it works. That's how, I mean, that is how it works. Yeah. Daryl, is there, because we, I, I, I'm, I don't want to impede on your time, but is there anything more that you want to share about the One People's Project? And I can bring up the website if there's anything you want to draw our attention to. I think that um, the only thing that I would say is that there is a lot of material that um, we have had out there since we started 20 some odd years ago. Um, I have documentaries like Alt-Right Age of Rage where we actually discuss the issue of free speech. Um, there is, um, I've been all over the place over the past some odd years talking to people about how to combat this uh, this element that we deal with. And um, I think people can learn a lot from our website at onepeoplesproject.com. We also have a news line called idavox.com. It's named after Ida B. Wells. Why is it named after Ida B. Wells? Because she was a woman who started a newspaper to address things that, you know, your mainstream media at the time would not. And in her case, it was the lynchings that were going on in, the, um, in society at the time. And... That is what's important. That's how you use your freedom of speech. You go out there and you um and you advocate for not just advocate, but you just make sure people get information the way um the way they should. Um, if you go to um Idavox, you'll see a number of articles, just straight up news articles, not just from us, but from um other outlets like Unicorn Ride and It's Going Down, which are other anti-fascist uh websites, and and you'll and you'll learn a lot. You'll understand a lot. You'll understand more often than not just how much um, how much is going on out there in the world that you probably don't even know about. And remember, we are subjective. We're not necessarily objective. We just make sure that we have the facts straight whenever we um, go out there. So when we are dealing with uh, neo fascists, we definitely have a uh, sometimes snarky bent against them. So. <laughs> Yeah. It doesn't even matter if they had passed away. We really, we really don't care. We just, we just simply want people out there to get the information, and and we are very opinionated it, with that information. So that's what I would just say. People can come to onepeoplesproject.com or idavox.com, and um, you'll learn a lot. You can always um, hit me up from those websites so you can understand more. Daryl, this has been informative, and I appreciate it. Uh, if there's one thing in your work that you just want to underscore about what, what you're trying to achieve, what would that be? We need to be, um, the reason why we're called One People's Project is because in the end, we are all one people. We all need to um, recognize each other as one people. However, unfortunately, there are those out there who want to divide us, who want to polarize us with their hate and their bigotry, which is why our slogan is hate has consequences. Sometimes we do have to keep people from being more than too powerful. You know, we, we do have to um, just basically maintain an eternal vigilance against those individuals if we want to have the society that we want. Right. Um, thank you for joining us and thanks for watching and the website is there.